in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. It is 100% real. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the NSA. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Curious Dimension podcast. I am your host, Matt Barone. I want to thank everybody who has been watching the episodes. The feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. The YouTube channel is now up to 6,000 subscribers, and I want to see if we can get to that 10,000 subscriber mark. So if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please take a moment and hammer that subscribe button, hit the like button, and leave a comment. I would love to hear what you guys think. My guest today is Freddie Silva. Freddie is a best-selling author and leading researcher of ancient civilizations, restricted history, sacred sites, and their interaction with consciousness. He is also the leading expert on crop circles. He has published nine books in six languages and produced 16 documentaries. Described by one CEO as perhaps the best metaphysical speaker in the world right now, for two decades, he has been an international keynote speaker with notable appearances at the International Science and Consciousness Conference, the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energies and Energy Medicine, and the Association for Research and Enlightenment, in addition to appearances on Gaia TV, History Channel, BBC, and hundreds of radio shows and podcasts. He leads sellout tours to sacred sites in England, France, Egypt, Portugal, Yucatan, Peru, Bolivia, and Scotland. It was really a privilege to speak with Freddie today. I hope you guys really enjoy this. Without further ado, here's Freddie Silva. All right, Freddie. We are rocking and rolling. How are you today? Oh, not too bad. Yeah, I'm glad we could finally, uh, finally connect up and uh, have a fun little discussion. Um, I, I wanted to start, Freddie, but maybe you could just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Um, and how you kind of got into this, this work of, you know, ancient civilization and ancient structures and, and then maybe towards the end, we can get into your extensive work in crop circles and, um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, let's recover quite a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was drawing pyramids when I was three. So something was up. Uh, I think I came to, uh, this planet with some kind of mission. And it, it was sort of bugging me for years while I was in the commercial world, uh, far away from what I'm doing now. And then one day after getting uh, fired for having a conscience, I was picked up a book on the great pyramid, which I'd been sitting on my shelf for years and I, I never got around to reading it. And, uh, all the times when I was unemployed, uh, again, because I kept, uh, debating as to why we're advertising artificial sweeteners that kill people. And then I find myself, you know, out of work because I kept sort of you know, having a conscience about these things. It gave me the opportunity to come back to what I really wanted to do. I just never knew how to go about making a living uh, doing it. And then one day I just took a big leap of faith. And uh, here I am, what, 25 years later, um, and still sort of at the top, top of my game, not really giving up and as busy as ever. So in fact, I'm about to release my ninth book in about three weeks. So uh, nothing stops. Good. Yeah. And so you're of the opinion, you're just going to keep doing this. This there's no reason to ever retire from, from a, from a, a lifestyle and a career like this. This is a, this is a lifelong pursuit, right? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we're just having this conversation with my accountant and they're saying, well, you know, um, sort of coming up to the age of retirement. I said, what, uh, I, my vocation is my vacation and my vacation is my vocation. And, uh, thanks to the wonderful uh, American accounting system, I can write it all off. So, you know, why would I bother stop doing what I'm doing? I mean, the only thing that will sort of get me to quieten down a little bit is if the airlines keep overcharging, uh, yeah. for airfares as they are right now, uh, unfortunately. Um, so that does curtail the opportunity to sort of travel quite a bit, but still, um, there's so much going on. Uh, one discipline leads to another. And I don't really have a plan. I never have a plan. It just goes to where my passion is going. I don't really follow a specific curve or any point of view or follow the latest sort of bandwagon. Um, that's not my thing. I just go where I feel particularly uh, uh, enchanted to. And then I feel that with my passion, that'll bring in the audience. And so far, it's worked out pretty well. 
I mean, that's a great arc of your life and what a great thing to be able to do your passions and make a living at it and not have to kind of follow the trends of what's, what's cool at the moment. Exactly. Um, I didn't say it was a great living. I said, I'm making a living. <laughs> I try to qualify that one. Uh, well, you know, if you could have longevity in this space, I think that there's a lot to be said for that. And so, um, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's a very cool thing. I, I want to get into something like on this podcast, we, I've had several researchers here in the crop circle phenomenon, and I think I have a pretty good smart about, about what's kind of going on there. But one other area that you, you're very good at and that you spent a lot of time researching that we haven't gotten into yet is ancient structures, ancient civilizations, myths, traditions, these sort of stories that have been passed down to us. My, my first question is about some of these ancient structures. And, and what I'm starting to learn about is that it doesn't seem that they're placed randomly, some of them. I was wondering, first, we could start with that. Maybe some of the more known ancient structures, why are they kind of placed where they are? Is, is there something going on there? Yeah, there is. Uh, I mean, the more we begin to look at the clusters of uh, ancient structures, uh, like Karnak in France, for example, uh, uh, the pyramids of Egypt, um, Yucatan, the temples of Yucatan, you find significant clusters and you start taking a sort of a, a view back of the situation. And the first thing that's very obvious is they're all associated with very old traditions uh, and folklore of the arrival of what we call gods, uh, humans. Uh, they call them human-like, but not quite human. Uh, human beings, which are much taller than we are, uh, with very light skin, uh, blonde hair, with uh, red hair as well, uh, blue-green eyes, which doesn't sound like they're uh, local. Uh, and in fact, that's the one thing that stands out. In Polynesia or South America, they'll say, yeah, no, they didn't look like us. Uh, they were much more, much more different. And uh, we didn't sort of worship these people. Uh, they were just different. They knew about the laws of nature, and they knew much more about things that we didn't. Uh, so, and they taught us a lot of what we know. So, um, the, the idea of gods really comes from, uh, or our understanding of gods in the Western world comes from a perverted Christian view where there's some white guy up in the sky with a big long beard and uh, dispensing bad news all the time. That's not what it's about. It was about a cooperation between two different civilizations that lived parallel. So that's the first connection that all of these things happen within a specific space of time usually at the end of the Ice Age, at the, at the close of the Younger Dryas. So that was about 9,700 BC. The second thing that's very apparent is the choice of geology. They tend to favor a lot of limestone, usually the deepest limestone aquifers or huge plains full of limestone. And if you ask a, an electrician about this, they'll say, well, that's fantastic because if you have water running through limestone or under limestone, the percolation of the uh, moisture through limestone creates a very low-lying electrical current on the land. So you're already occupying a space on the earth where the laws of physics are behaving a little bit differently. And then, of course, you've got the choice of stone. Uh, nothing ever got brought from locally. They made th their life very, very difficult by going as much as 400 miles down the Nile to get specific stones to build structures. And this happens all across the world, uh, even in Karnak in France. Uh, they would go 40 miles where the local stone was perfectly accessible and perfectly viable to build their menhirs and dolmens. But no, we want to go somewhere else because this is the kind of stone. So once you start looking at the type of stone, they will have another thing in common, and that is a very high level of iron. So if you happen to be near these places when there's a, a thunderstorm, move. <laughs> uh, they tend to hit these spots very regularly. Two, it's, uh, they have a, a, a huge amount of quartz in the stone, and not just any old quartz. It was the same type of quartz that was used for the first radio receivers that we created in the 19th century. So there's a connection there in terms of a pH electric effect. And thirdly, they're full of magnetite, and that al allows them to connect much easier to the Earth's magnetic field and also to interact with human beings because the three things I just mentioned, iron, quartz, and magnetite are found in the human body. So quartz is silica, that's your bone. Uh, we have a lot of iron that's dissolved in the blood that flows through all the veins in the human body. So when you interact with these places, you're already being influenced in your own body by itself or your own temple, we should say. And we have millions of particles of magnetite flowing up in the skull. So if you go into these sites, you are interacting with a low level magnetic field, which 
get you into an altered state of consciousness. Uh, so that's by design. So that's just three things that unites these things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's super interesting to me that they're using and the, and how they're using those materials is not arbitrary. Aren't they putting certain stones on the outside and then certain stones on the inside of certain structures? Like maybe we could take ancient Egypt, for example, which I know you're, you're familiar with. Are they putting the limestone specifically on certain areas of this and then other types of stone on the interior, like granite? Is that correct? Yeah. So what, it's so what creating is creating a kind of a battery. Purpose? Yeah, it's creating kind of a battery. You've got a limestone which has a negative charge and granite has a positive charge. So if you look at it from afar, you're looking at uh, basically two poles that are working together to create a certain field. And uh, we see this again in places like Silver Hill in England, and many of the places called the uh, the burial mounds, where no one's buried, of course. Uh, they, they, they're usually associated with giant people. Uh, and usually, if anything, you'll find the bones of uh, uh, giant people eight and a half feet tall in these giant graves, the specific bones, the, the tibia, the forefinger, and the skull, nothing else. So it suggests a, a much more uh, shamanic connection, if anything. And it turns out that these things are also built with layers of organic and inorganic material, uh, just like an organ accumulator. If anybody's familiar with the work of Wilhelm Reich, you'll, you'll know this. If you, if you build a box made of cedar wood lined with uh, steel wool and organic wool, and you put someone in there, uh, within six minutes, they will actually uh, be healed of whatever it is that they're sort of suffering from. Leave them in there for more than 12 minutes and it starts taking the energy away. So there's a finite amount of time that you can be within these spaces. But now, because we've got the technology to measure the frequency of the background of what's going on in the landscape, it's, um, it's been discovered that when you are outside of these temples, there's a certain frequency around them, which is, which is everywhere. Uh, like we live in the big electromagnetic soup, especially with uh, cell phones and so forth. But the design of the, of the buildings is such that when you go in, it filters out all these frequencies and draws the inside frequency to a point that allies with your state of consciousness, uh, which is about 4.6 hertz, if I'm not mistaken. And it's literally getting you to stop thinking and getting you to start feeling. So again, we can start uh, hypothesizing that these buildings were all designed to get you into a certain state of mind that allows you to connect with a much finer level of reality. Yeah, I mean, it, just to go back to Egypt, because this one to me is the most stunning structure that we still have standing today. When I look at that, I, I think to myself, there has to be some sort of return on the investment. It's just, <laughs> it, I mean, it's just, it's just so big and it's just so precise. And you have these alignments to where it's a, almost a scalar model to the earth. And there's all these sacred geometric measurements and harmonic proportions within it. It doesn't need to be like that if you're just going to bury a dead person in there. Yeah. So, so do you think this is multifaceted? Are there multiple reasons why it has to be this? Or is there one function? What, what is your hypothesis on this? Oh, over long periods of time, there's no doubt that they were used for multiple purposes. I mean, the Egyptians were notorious for stealing other people's uh, works and then claiming it for themselves. I mean, Ramesses II was particularly good at it. Uh, and they even attributed three pyramids to the same pharaoh. Now, if they're burial places, that, why does one guy need three places in which to bury one body? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, all it says is the buildings belong to Sneferu. Yeah, because that, he was the guy who was running the country at the time. When he dies, the next pharaoh takes over. The buildings belong now to uh, Catherine and so forth. Um, I believe, uh, I go back to the folklore uh, and the myths and traditions of people because they were closer to the events than we are today. Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, but the, the, we are further away from the alleged building date of the, uh, the Great Pyramids, which by the way, is based on completely false evidence, I should, I should point out. Uh, they, were, they basically found carbon-14 dating in some of the grout between the stones of the Great Pyramid. But the original building, when you go inside, there is no grout. The stones are fitted without any mortar. So what you're looking at, you're dating the restoration work that kept going again and again and again. So even using 3000 BC as a sort of midpoint, that was actually closer to the point where we have the end of the younger drives than we are today. So we've got to listen to what these people were saying and what their ancestors were saying. And one of the stories that I keep going back to in Egypt is about the dream of uh, one pharaoh called Sauron. 
who basically was saying, I had this incredible, strange dream that there was these mountains of fire coming out of the sky, which sounds to me like comets, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to destroy the entire planet. We're going to be overwhelmed by massive tidal waves and things. So he gets together all the people in his room. They're all uh, astrologers and astronomers, and they're saying, well, can you do a prognostication of the sky? Uh, to find out if I'm just making this up, or is it really a prophetic vision? And they said, actually, in about 300 years, the Earth is going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and everything's going to be destroyed. To which the reply is, well, we've been around for about 30,000 years. And this is written on a papyrus, by the way, which nobody wants to talk about. It's a very inconvenient date. And it says, um, we've gathered so much information, we don't want this just to die and have the whole of civilization start again from scratch with living in caves and drag women by the hair and uh, go back to eating meat again. Uh, they were all vegetarians, the gods, apparently. Uh, and um, they said, what should we do? And one guy puts his hand up, uh, the uh, god Jehuti, who the Greeks later termed Toth. Uh, by the way, it was a title, not a name. There was a lot of them. Uh, like, there's a lot of Horuses as well, mm -hmm. uh, just to confuse things. And uh, he said, um, I know, we shall build pyramids. And I'll order them to be uh, built. And uh, we'll store everything that we've ever has ever come to our ears in the buildings. Boom, end of story. Now, it took me 15 years uh, to sort of look at all this information and stand back a little bit and go, I get it. Okay, if I'm in their shoes and I'm about to be hit with big tidal waves, and these things were huge, uh, they would be up to three miles high. And there's evidence to back this up now. And Los Alamos uh, Research Laboratory, their ballistics department has actually proved this is actually totally possible. And uh, they said that, and I was thinking, if I was in their shoes, I was coming back to Egypt in a rearranged landscape. What would be left when a big wave goes through the land? A pyramid. That's not going anywhere. Uh, and they're also perfectly aligned to the uh, the to north, uh, grid north. So any person coming back to find out either repositories can look at the buildings and go, well, there they are. We just go in, lift the big uh, sort of stone that pivots and go in and find uh, all the stuff in perfect state of preservation. And the same thing happens for the Serapeum between the uh, pyramids of Dashur and Giza. That's an underground temple with these enormous boxes, which are built yes. to the hard on the, with the hardest rocks on the planet, perfectly sealed. Uh, they are airproof and waterproof. And the buildings in Dashur and Giza would have been a perfect market for triangulating the position of these underground sites. And what we find out today, of course, the, the lids have been moved and the contents, boom, taken away. So that's my particular theory. And also the fact that the buildings themselves, if you look at the numbers of how they put together, they give you the dimensions of the earth, the solar system and so forth. So they are basically a book. So if you're coming back to start uh, from scratch, all you have to do is look at the angles, the dimensions, and you've got yourself a barometer on the basic laws of life, where you are on the planet, uh, how it relates to the actual cycle of uh, growth, in terms of the seasons, and you can rebuild civilization. It's a very practical thing. Of course, the downside is if the people that, that understand this information, if they died during the flood, now you have to go back to scratch. So there is a, a, a slight error, a margin of error in their thinking, but it was very good thinking, I believe. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the, the latest Egyptian civilization that inhabited those was, were they around 3,000 years? I mean, that's that's impressive if that's correct. If you have a civilization that's last that long, I mean, here in the United States, we're, we're like not even a couple hundred years in yet. Oh, and two so, generations who were already downhill. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So they were doing something right. Very smart people indeed. Um, so what what is your take? And I know this is probably hard to answer, but what is your take on Antarctica? I mean, I know there's obviously a lot of activity going on there. There's treaties there that it's not supposed to be militarized, although it's seems to be being militarized. Do you think at one point in time that was maybe in a different position or maybe there was land there that was exposed that had greenery on it? What is your position on that? Oh, there's lots of evidence to show that only 4,000 years ago, the Royce, uh, the Royce, the Ross Ice Shelf uh, was actually exposed. There was running water and there was uh, vegetation, trees and a river. And that was only 4,000 years ago. So the um, crystallization of ice in that particular part of the world, it comes and goes. Uh, and we also know because of te plate tectonics that uh, at one point the Queen Maud land, which is that big strip that winds its way towards southern Chile and Argentina and Patagonia, 
It used to be at the same latitude as Santiago in Chile. Uh, so, and, that, and that's moved over a few uh, sort of millennia. So we know that it was definitely a much more temperate climate uh, just because of the fossil and the uh, animal data that we keep finding, ironically, because of global warming. Uh, it's now revealing exactly what was there. As to what uh, is below the ice, I don't know. It's uh, pure speculation at this point. I mean, there's been the sighting of a pyramid mountain, but then again, if you look at the same thing uh, over Switzerland, there's a pyramid there called the Matterhorn, and it's perfectly natural. And there's one up on the Faroe Islands, and that's perfectly natural too. So until you go there uh, and uh, find out for, uh, for, for real, we simply don't know. But it, I would not be surprised to find the remains of something some ancient civilization there, just based on the fact that Queen Maud land itself was at a much uh, higher latitude and therefore very habitable. Yeah, I, I'm always, um, I guess I'm always curious when people say that, that human beings couldn't have done fantastic things tens of thousands of years ago, because I mean, if you give anatomically human beings time, to create things. And we have, what is the earliest evidence of anatomically modern humans? Is it going back 200,000? Oh, I think it's up to 400,000 now. Is it for it's just by the week now? Uh, I can't even keep up with all of this. Yeah. So <laughs> you're never going to convince me that similar, modern, uh, anatomically similar humans going back that long, you give them like 30,000 years of kind of uninterrupted, no cataclysms, and they have chances to, to advance you're going to get things like the Great Pyramid. I mean, where are we going to be in another 5,000 years? So yeah. I, I think something has definitely happened that has rearranged the surface of this, of this planet maybe more than once. And may, maybe there's a lot of stuff that's just gone missing. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, and maybe we have to kind of rediscover those things. I mean, what, how far back do you think it goes? I mean, if you had to speculate. Um, it's impossible to say. I mean, you'd have to dig up the Earth uh, all the way down to the bedrock across the entire planet. Uh, and there's no way we're going to be able to do that. Uh, everything reverts back into dust or coal at some point. Uh, but we do have evidence of uh, things like uh, uh, pots of iron that suddenly are found in a big seam of coal under the North Sea uh, in a place that was a forest uh, about 5 million years ago. So how the hell did a pot made of iron, cast iron, find its way under the North Sea? in a seam of coal and in South Africa as well. I mean, th these objects are all over the place. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman that did the, uh, um, the, the research, Michael Cremo, he did a uh, wonderful research, on all of these out of place artifacts, which are very inconvenient. Uh, there's a, a road, which is made of uh, actually more like a mosaic structure, which is found in Oklahoma and 30 feet of silt. And that would have been the uh, edge of the, uh, Gulf of Mexico 35,000 years ago. And again, we don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so it's impossible to say, but what I will say, dr uh, drawing a parallel with our present culture is that we have people with computers, there's people driving Porsches, and uh, we have people who design nuclear power stations. At the same time, on the opposite side of the world, you still have people who are wandering around the jungle, barefoot, uh, naked with a bow and arrow, uh, making a living just by eating and sleeping and doing the best they can. So and we habit this planet very, you know, very easily. So why not the same thing 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 years ago? There's always a parallel civilization on the face of the earth that happens to be more advanced than other people. Uh, and that's perfectly logical, just using uh, that uh, often used method called Occam's razor, which is the scientist way of getting out of trouble. Uh, you know, in all likelihood, the, 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 uh, the most obvious answer is probably the truth. Well, in this case, I'm going to use that. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason why that long ago, there wasn't another section of uh, humanity, uh, that was a bit more advanced. And like the ancestors say all around the world, um, there was a time when there was a, we were living here with other people who were more advanced than us and they were human like, but not quite human. And, uh, that's when we have the evidence in all the giants graves around the world and all the traditions that follow them. Maybe we could dig into one of those traditions real quick. Um, I know that recently you were in uh, New Zealand and yeah, yeah. Um, you were, you were, I don't know if you have been studying, the, uh, I, I'm going to butcher this. Is it the Watahari? Uh, the Waitaha. The Waitaha. Can you speak to those traditions a little bit, the myths they have um, and what you, what you were kind of up to there in New Zealand? 
Oh, it's one of the most important uh, pieces of the puzzle that no one's ever looked at. Uh, and I'm even surprised that Tor Heyerdahl, when he was over in Easter Island, didn't pick up on that. That was, that was surprising because uh, he was a very astute researcher. And um, I came across him really by accident on my first trip when I went to New Zealand about 17 years ago. And someone gave me a copy of their oral tradition that had just been published. And uh, I devoured it. And I was astonished that no one picked up the fact that these people had lived on Easter Island and they describe Easter Island as an archipelago. And you have to be an oceanographer to understand what you're talking about here because that was 12,000 years ago before the sea level rose, Easter Island was a series of islands. Now, you wouldn't have known that otherwise. You'd have to really go into oceano oceanographical studies to understand that and, and create this story. And uh, if we look at the time when... They were living there. They said, this is the time when there was uh, a, a gods that were traveling around the Pacific in these double hull uh, catamarans. They were called the Urukeu. They were very tall. They were light skinned. They were long, sometimes with red hair. And uh, they were very nice people. They would stop off on Easter Island from a place that they already had a big civilization in South America around Lake Titicaca. Uh, and um, they actually named it named as the location by the fact that the gods used to take two totem birds with them whenever they went back to their homeland. One was called Titi, one was called Kaka. Uh, and you put those two together and you go, well, it can't be anywhere else. So they're already in Tiwanaku uh, and they had built Tiwanaku before then. And Tiwanaku is uh, dates to about 15,000 BC. So we're now in this 15,000 to 12,000 BC era. And the story goes that the Waitaha, uh, sorry, the Uruke used to stop off on Easter Island to take on water, fish, and so forth. And uh, they used to share their stories with the Waitaha, which they went into three baskets of knowledge. They're the three houses of wisdom. And those baskets represent the three belt stars of Orion with whom the Uruke were very intimately associated. And when they give you the physical description, they are, it's the same description of Viracocha and his gods in South America and the followers of Horus in Egypt. And all of them have the same physiognomy, same purpose, same association with Orion. So eventually by about 8,000 BC, the Waitaha navigate down to the birthplace of the gods, which is where the Uruke used to have their spiritual school. And it's still there to this very day. I've been there seven times, can't get enough of it. And um, basically, they, that's where they hardwire the wisdom into the, each of the stones that make up this uh, spine of this ridge uh, in a beautiful part of the country. Uh, so it's, again, uh, oral tradition gets repub uh, finally published in 1996. Uh, and the second book is even more interesting. And then now they're working on a third book, which I hope to lend a little hand to. Uh, they need all the help they can get because... The official story is that the Maori are indigenous in New Zealand, and even the Maori are saying, we're not indigenous. It's just a group of people who want to get money from the British because they lost their, their country. Well, they took their country from somewhere, from 13 other tribes. So it's, it's a bit contentious. Uh, and yeah, I've had death threats from a, a few people, but that's okay. Uh, I'll just publish it. And uh, if I die, the information lives on. Hmm. Interesting. Have you, have you made it to Easter Island yourself? You know, I've been trying to get there, and it's a long, long and expensive way from Maine. Uh, even via South America, it's a long, long way. Mm -hmm. There's no direct way. So next time I'm in New Zealand, I found out during the low season, you can fly from Auckland to Tahiti, stay there for the weekend over there, uh, and then fly to Easter Island. It's much more feasible for a tall guy like me, and it's a fraction of the price. So uh, no, all my information from Easter Island comes from... Uh, other sources. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about the Moai? Is that how you pronounce it? Moai that are there? The Moai? Oh, the, uh, the statues? The statues the that are, that are, they look like heads, but they go down much deeper, don't they? Oh, they go up 39 feet. They have a complete body and, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, almost down to the tiny little legs at the bottom. Yeah. I was actually in touch with a uh, archeologist that was working there uh, for many, many years doing some good digging. And they finally got to the base of one of the statues. There's a photograph of it. And I contacted her because I was just about finishing my book, The Missing Lands, which is all about the missing civilizations and all their traditions. And uh, I said, you know, I'm about to go to press, but it would be great to have this information from you and quote you uh, about the dating, the carbon-14 dating, now that you can get under the statue and find some organic material. And she said, well, it'll be coming up, but it will publish in about six months. Well, six months went by and nothing happened. 
year later, nothing happened. Two years after that, nothing. And I finally said to her, look, uh, can you at least give me an idea of the dating? I, I'm not going to quote you on it until the, the paper comes out. I'll, I'll respect that. And the answer was that it'll be commensurate with the um, accepted dating of the uh, civilization on the island. In other words, it's a whitewash uh, mm. because, again, the official version is people only arrived on Easter Island about, what, 800 years ago or something, uh, or 1,200 years ago. And the Waitaha alone says, that's ridiculous. We were there 12,000 years before that. Right. And lots of other people have said this. And the, uh, they said there's two versions of the story here, which is also found in the Cook Islands. Uh, I was talking to the last surviving wisdom keeper of the Cook Islands, and he said, you know what? It's important to know that the uh, Moai are built in two stages. One, there's the basalt ones, okay? These are the old original Moai. They represent the Urukeu, those tall gods with the long ears and everything. And the quarry for the, for the basalt is 80 feet below sea level. And that's before the rise of sea level at the end of the ice age. So now you just dated the basalt Moai to being more than 12,000 years old, exactly as the stories say. And then he said the uh, newer ones, which are the, uh, the volcanic tuft, which is a much easier stone to work with. And it's not quite as precise. Now they represent the chiefs of the island, which are the historical chiefs. So this is where archaeology gets you all wrong. And uh, they're confusing all the Moai and they're lumping them all together where there's two separate stages. And excuse me, there's a difference of about 8,000 years between the two. Uh, so again, tradition, uh, trumps, um, archaeology again. Yes, it. Something else that always boggles my mind. And I know this, this topic has been beaten to death and I don't think anybody has the full answer, but, but I'm suspecting that, you know, like you said at the beginning of the conversation, some of these rocks that they're quarrying from are very far away, some 400 miles away in some instances, and they're rather large, you know, yeah. um, in some cases, are, are they thousands of tons in some cases? I think the biggest one is the third drop that's been found in the quarry in Lebanon near Belbek. We used to oh, see the, the first Baldac, one yeah. sticking out of the, uh, the ground. They've been digging and digging. They found a second one and they figured, oh, wait a minute. Uh, this one is 1,600 tons. Oh, and there's a third one below it. That's 1,800 tons. And there's nothing on earth now that can lift that. Uh, it, it is impressive. And you think, well, why? Well, because they could. Uh, yes. And it's to do it again with the stories of uh, from South America, Central America, all the way around the world. Uh, they said, yeah, these things were built overnight. Uh, they used sound or vocal command. And the stones lifted. And a child just pushed these things along these conveyor belts called the earth tillery current. Uh, and um, I, you know, you look at this as a myth and you think, okay, once it's funny, secondly, it's coincidence, and third, it's like, what the hell is going on here? They couldn't have been making this up from different parts of the world. Well, there's a group of people at Princeton called the Princeton Engineering uh, Anomalies Research Department. Uh, I think they've all died of old age now, uh, but the uh, peer reviewed uh, material is still around because you can check this. And they looked at the, exactly the thing I was talking about the um, type of quartz in stones. And they said, well, what if we take a little lump of that quartz, put it in a tube and start throwing sound frequency at it? And they did, and they, ch they played around with amplitude and different frequencies. When they got the two together, and, uh, they sh and there was a video that was up on, uh, on their site uh, back about 20 years ago. And it showed quite clearly that they hit that right amplitude and the piece of quartz lifts inside that tube so now we know that sound frequency is able to work with the quartz, a pH of electric substance in the stones to get it to do a bit of anti-gravity. And again, it ties in beautifully with what the folklore was saying. So now science is just validating these, uh, these stories. Yeah. I mean, that's mind boggling to see how they would do that. And I've heard lots of different theories, but yeah, I mean, even if let's just say they weren't doing that and they were moving these things somehow with mechanical leverage. How long would it take? It doesn't make any sense to, to do it's it. It's labor-intensive, very labor-intensive. I mean, there are hieroglyphs in Egypt which clearly show a bunch of, uh, uh, I guess they were slaves. Uh, they certainly didn't look like they were happy. Uh, pulling this massive statue on sledges, uh, Ramesses II. So that's a historical fact. They were doing it, but that's a lot of trouble especially in a place, uh, by the time of Ramesses' time, 
you've lost all your forests because Egypt is now a desert. So you're cutting down the very thing that will prevent the sand from moving and gives you shade and brings down the re residual temperature in a place where it's usually hot. So there's a three things that are working against logic right there. Uh, but I guess by then they would have lost the plot anyway. So there must have been something earlier that precedes that that would have been much easier. Because again, you're right. It, it requires a huge amount of strain on the infrastructure because these people also have to go and eat and hunt for food. Uh, so you're taking, uh, what, 80% of the local population and the, the uh, pushing them to do something which is basically not going to uh, be part of your survival. Uh, you can't grow food and hunt food and eat and sleep while you're busy making big monuments. Uh, there'll be no purpose to continuing civilization. I, I find the logic really quite uh, faulty. Another thing is, I, you're a short drive from Massachusetts. I'm wondering, have you ever met with Robert Schock? On oh, God, yeah. Program? Oh, yeah. He owes me a couple of drinks, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah tight old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that uh, uh, as a friend. Uh, we, in fact, we, we, we're going to be sharing the stage at uh, CPAC, uh, the conference in uh, California in October. Uh, so, yeah, we share a lot of information. We're always talking about, in fact, we were talking about the Moai uh, at, in Virginia Beach. And I said, you know what? I'm just an amateur geologist. So you're, you're a pro. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the sediment that covers up those heads and the body, that's not 800 years of sediment, especially given the uh, climate there. And uh, the, the uh, geologist says, no, I mean, you're talking thousands and thousands of years of sedimentation. If you're going to cover a statue by 39 feet, that's thousands of years, not a few hundred. So we're pretty much in agreement with that. Yeah. And for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Robert Schock is a geologist. I think he has a couple different PhDs, if I'm not mistaken. He's a pretty um, clever guy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's pretty high up in the food chain. But he, he said something interesting about the, uh, the erosion on the Sphinx, that yeah. it's clear fluvial erosion. Um, can you speak that a little bit? Do you know what his 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 uh, his position is on? Oh, it's very clear. Uh, it's a fact that uh, this goes back to a time when there's a pluvial climate in Egypt. The only way you can account, not just for the Sphinx, but primarily the enclosure. I mean, you, I've been there 30 times, and you can clearly see the effects of serious water erosion. And the only way you can achieve that with that kind of limestone, because there are hard layers and softer layers of limestone, is if you talk about a time between 9,000 BC, which is the end of the Ice Age, all the way to about 6,000 BC. After that, the weather really changed. It became much drier. So you've got 3,000 years of, of heavy rainfall in which to do that kind of damage. And also the fact that the, the Nile was much higher back then and closer to the Giza Plateau. And that's where you see the bottom of the sculpting. There was actually a wash going on in the softer layers. And you can see that. And then the Nile go, uh, recedes, you get another layer of uh, declination like this. Uh, you can see again, another part of the wash in the softer stones. Uh, you can literally, if you stand next to the wall of the pyramid enclosure, you can see the layers of the go like, not like this, they're going like this, that shows the Nile moving further away. And today, of course, it's a 15 minute drive before you find the Nile. Interesting. Um, I'd like to move the conversation a little bit into subtle energy. Um, this is something I'm starting to study a little bit, and we're seeing evidence there. But what can you speak to on these subtle energies bringing mass spectrometers into um, at these these ancient these ancient sites, and then maybe we can kind of go into crop circles in a minute. Um, but what what do we know? What have we measured around these ancient sites, and, and what are we showing the effects with human beings around this stuff? Oh, there's been lots of wonderful little studies, and I'm just surprised that there's no more money to fund these things. Uh, they're getting on a bit now. Uh, they were done in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, and it usually involved dragging a magnetometer uh, across the ground and looking for resistivity and then getting a computer printout. And one of the most famous ones involves the Royal Wright Stone Circle in Oxfordshire in England, and it shows circle, and there's three stones that deviate from the actual circle which form the de facto entrance. And uh, when they finished dragging this plate across the ground, and you can see the printout coming up on the computer, it shows this uh, band of energy that goes towards the entrance stones and then like uh, starts behaving like a big corkscrew 
and it goes to the center of the stone circle and poof, right down into the center, like a big whirlpool. And it's very definitive. It's a machine looking for subtle energy. Um, there's been other uh, uh, things that have been done using electrodes that have been planted uh, around the Henge monuments, like Avebury and Stonehenge. And they clearly show that uh, the uh, energy of the surrounding landscape dissipates at night, just like someone going to sleep. And then just before dawn, before the sun creeps over the horizon, all the electromagnetic readings start charging back to the land, but they get attracted to the stone and they go into the actual um, henge, which is this very deep, almost 120 foot deep um, a circle around the actual stone circle. Or oh, they're getting a bit shorter now because of the sedimentation, uh, but the original ones are very, very deep. This energy is channeled around the actual hedge and it keeps going around until the moment that the sun creeps over the horizon. And then it's like a doorway opens where the portal stones act exactly like a portal and the energy swims into the center of the uh, stone circles at twice the frequency of the surrounding land. There is no one on the planet that has just been able to, uh, to explain how the henge monuments and the stone circles are able to double the frequency of the natural laws of the landscape. It, it's a mystery. But yeah. if, I believe, again, it goes back to the design, the shaping of things, the geology, and also the choice of stone that's acting like a... In fact, someone made a very interesting remark that the way that the stones are placed with their uh, magnetic poles opposite each other, it's yeah. like a particle collider. That's what exactly what they're doing. They're moving the energy like a particle collider. So it basically frames them within a positive and negative environment to channel the energy into a certain direction, which is the reason, uh, one of the reasons why Stonehenge, the center of Stonehenge is shaped like a big cup in 2D. It literally is corralling all of this energy into the altar, which is why it's called the altar. It's altering it. Interesting. I mean, so we had to speculate some of the functions of harnessing these subtle energies. Does it have something to do with enhancing the yield of the crop? Does it have something to do with the, the, the human being and, and and the mind and health. I mean, is it multifaceted? Uh, it just just boggles my mind. Like, why are they going to such trouble if they know this exists? Mm. What it, what is it being used for? Like, what 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 are some of the best theories out there? Oh, it's uh, it's multifaceted. Um, one of them is the fact that they get the biggest concentrations of stone sanding stones also happen to coincide with the most uh, active earthquake areas. They're on fault lines. It's almost as though they they're doing a kind of earth acupuncture. And I'm thinking of the time when these things were built. This is a time when the earth is recalibrating at the end of the ice age. There's massive tectonic activity, great earthquake activity. And I suspect that they're placed where they are, uh, because without exception, they mark the position of the earth to lyric currents and where they cross. So if you connect the, uh, and overlay, overlay the places where the earthquake zones exist, it's almost as like they're fine tuning and they're dissipating some of the energy, which would be catastrophic for the rebuilding of civilization. That makes a lot of sense. It's a very practical thing. Uh, and also the second thing is psychological. Uh, the frequencies do ally with uh, states of consciousness that allow you to cross into the other world or another level of, of reality. So it's used for shamanic experience. Uh, and again, the folklore backs that up as well. And yes, they are also involved with the growth for, uh, th for the fertilization of seeds. Um, there was a gentleman, and I wish I could remember his name. I'll, it'll probably come to me uh, halfway through the, this conversation. Um, he was looking at this folklore as well about how the center of every ancient civilization always begins as a temple or a standing stone. No matter where you go around the planet, the starting point of any town, village, or city is always a standing stone or a temple. So we've got the telluric currents, you know, and there's temple forming the X that marks the spot. And he also looked at this information and he said, it's funny how we look at Central America and the Yucatan Peninsula and the Maya in specific, and those flat top pyramids. And they said that you would have needed a huge civilization that would have had to grow successive crop rotation, even in the winter, in order to feed that amount of people to create all of these temple cities that we're now discovering. There are hundreds of them now buried in the jungle. And so the only way you could do this is by having some kind of a fertilization technique that enables you to grow a crop four to five times a year. And they actually place the seeds of corn on top of the pyramid of Chichen Itza, the uh, Kukulkan. And they actually found that at a certain times of the year and of the day, 
the energy is such that it creeps up the building to the top and it creates an electrical charge that gets imprinted into the actual seeds. So they did germination tests and they found that the seeds uh, have been impregnated with an electrical charge that allows them to outgrow normal corn by two to one. So this, the uh, crop is actually much bigger and much healthier. But if you keep doing that over certain times of the year, you can replant. And they've now realized uh, from certain archaeological activity that, yeah, they were able to get five crops, whereas most people can only get two or three at the maximum. That's how they're able, they were able to keep the civilization of that size going. So we now have three reasons uh, why all these places were built where they were. Uh, and there's probably a few more out there that we haven't even quite found out yet. And I think that's, um, maybe this is a good uh, segue into a, a quick conversation about crop circles. H have they done some work on that as well? Or they've taken the, or like if a crop gets harvested where a circle pops up and they're detecting these frequencies, is the yield much higher the next year in some cases? Yes, it is. That's where the original information came from. Uh, it was one of the researchers, uh, one of the scientists that was doing hands-on information in the crop circles that led to that conclusion with the Maya about seed development because the farmers were telling us, yeah, we've had a real crop circle there. And they could tell the difference between man-made and real, by the way, back in the 80s. Uh, they were not so sort of obsessed with uh, Doug and Dave and this absolute nonsense that was created by uh, the, the British Ministry of Defense, uh, sorry, MI5, I beg your pardon, MI5, they created this fictitious press agency to put those two idiots as the makers of all crop circles. I mean, get this, they made three crop circles in three different countries in the same evening. Figure that one out. Uh, they didn't think that one through very well. Uh, anyway, so they basically looked at the, uh, the seed and said, yeah, the area w that was affected in my field with the, that real crop circle last year, See how it's, the crops are actually growing ahead of the crop around it. And in fact, they were creating the inverse of the crop circle. So that the, what was laid down before is now uh, almost uh, twice the height of the actual crop. So you get the reverse crop circle. It was actually very funny. And that's how we began looking at this. Um, and we also began to realize that there were uh, psychological effects that were going on with people who were skeptical and they were going into the crop circles and being healed. Uh, literally heal the things that, that have been plaguing them for 10 years. And they went in there not even believing that this stuff was real. So you can't make this stuff up. And we had hundreds and hundreds of uh, case histories on this that led to us developing uh, this uh, effect. Uh, I kind of was the uh, progenitor of this uh, healing modality that involves crop circle symbols. And uh, I've never advertised them. And they're still popular as ever. And some of the feedback I get from people that uh, are able to receive healing, which I'm not allowed to mention that word uh, because of the um, uh, certain people uh, within the government. Um, and um, because we're basically using a very, uh, very cheap way of uh, getting healing modalities to people. And we're basically undermining a trillion dollar industry. And that's why it's happening. So I've never advertised this and we're still doing it. And that was all based on our observation of people's reactions to these things. So. Just like the standing stones are a temple, the crop circle is designed and built using exactly the same protocol. Trying to kind of look, long story short, we were working with people who had channeled the crop circles before they even appeared. Uh, we were given the locations, dates, everything. And so we knew that these people could be trusted. They were channeling a real source that could be validated in terms of field research. And um, we were told that there was healing modalities in the circles. There was... Um, new uh, modalities of mathematics, which was proved, uh, Gerald Hawkins proved new mathematical theorems in the circles and also new technology encoded into the designs as well. And there are three groups of scientists around the world who've actually uh, built the image on the front cover of my book, Secrets in the Field. And I put that image there for a reason, exactly for that reason, because they said, this is interesting. Let's build as a 3D model and it actually defies gravity. And that's what we were told some of the technologies to do with getting you away from fossil fuel and to uh, involving uh, issues that deal, deal with the illusion of gravity. And they use that actual phrase. Do you mind if we put that picture up real quick and just have a quick chat about it? The one that's on the cover of your book? If I had it, I could. No, I, I have it right here. I can do well, it. Well, in right that here. case, you, you can do some yeah. self promotion. Yeah. I'd <laughs> love to just put it up there. I didn't and, pay um... this guy to do this. <laughs> Let me know if you can see this. Can you see this? Yeah, one? that's the one. 
Yes. Yeah, I, I had to fight for that picture because my publisher did not want that picture. I said, I'm not going to have this book published. I'm going to veto the publishing unless this picture goes on the cover. And there was a Mexican standoff for three days. And maybe I thought I was getting a little bit too egocentric at this point. And uh, no, I won that fight because I knew what that crop circle did. And uh, we were told this in channeling. And it's been validated that it was an energy device. Uh, there's much more going on. And I can't tell you about it because I'm sworn to secrecy, but it's all good stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all to do with, um, let's say, helping the raising the consciousness of humanity. And then it's up to us to deal with it. So yeah, that's a very, very important design that was laid down. And what year is that? Is that 1991? Oh, now you're testing me. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get down Amnesia Lane. That was 1991, I believe. I've got Freddie Silva on the podcast. I got to take advantage. <laughs> 91. Yeah. So that's an absolutely beautiful uh, formation. And, and, and the stories that go along with some of these are, are absolutely mind boggling to me. Um, I do think it's a shame though, that, that there's this hoaxing phenomenon that's kind of just taken off here probably in the last, I don't know, what would you say 20 some years? And it's hard to kind of discern what's, what's authentic and, and what maybe man-made. Do you agree with that? It's been done to the muddy the waters. I mean, the, when the, when MI5 realized this is becoming a religion back in 1990, mm. they had to put a stop to it. And we have the minutes from the uh, discussion in the British parliament where the ministers under Margaret Thatcher's regime do discuss you know, bringing the whole phenomenon under control. Uh, so they, uh, and shortly after that, this fictitious press agency is made up and um, they had people from the Ministry of Defense manning the desks, feeding the information to the media. And the cheap media, uh, they brought it up immediately. Oh, oh, it's all a big joke. But the quality press didn't buy the story because they had read the actual scientific evidence that had been published before. And some of the stuff that we hadn't bothered to publish because we, you know, you got to keep a few things back in case these shenanigans uh, come to the fore, because then they can say, well, here's some information that you're not privy to. Now we're going to find out that you're basically lying to the whole world. Mm -hmm. Um, they were privy to this information and they said, and I quote, uh, the independent, uh, which is a quality newspaper back then, I have, uh, an easier time believing in little green men than the fact that these two made all the crop circles. It may be part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Uh, and after two, 1992, copycats came out and students came out and people just want to have a bit of fun at our expense. And then they went away. The real phenomenon came back until 1999. And the hoaxing really got out of control back then because you couldn't control it. You can't put a, a, you know, a big placard in the middle of a field and saying, no crop circles here. And if you stop the hoaxing, you reveal the real phenomenon. So they have to keep hoaxing as long as there's a real phenomenon to muddy the waters. After 2003, pretty much everything is man-made. And I'm sorry if that's bad news, but that is the truth. Uh, the last real, genuine, and complex crop circles that I, uh, I witnessed was in England in 2003. And there's three brilliant ones that took us weeks to figure out. After that, the whole thing is just being a big joke. So uh, if you're going to follow something, follow it for the right reasons. But like I said to people, if it makes you happy, uh, who am I to argue? But that is the, uh, the truth. Yeah, that's uh, that is a shame. Yeah, because it is is some of the formations that that are around, even even if they are man made, they are impressive. Some of the sheer... oh, they're impressive. They're working with fourteen people. I caught uh, three of these groups in England. Uh, one of them was the uh, the Land Rover group because they take the Land Rovers in the middle of the night, and we go around letting the air out of the tires just long enough for the police to go and catch them in the morning. Uh, it's a game. Uh, I catch them red handed. My friends have done it as well. Uh, but what they're doing is uh, they're destroying the farmer's uh, crop and they already have a difficult time as it is. Uh, if they're doing it with permission from the farmer, that's a different story. And they usually put up a little honesty box. People put in a, a pound when they go in because they're going to damage the crop. That's the big uh, difference between man-made and uh, genuine. The plants are fine. There's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. If you leave them alone, they come back up again. Uh, so the farmer's going to lose his uh, or her uh, crop. You might as well get a little bit of money for it, but now it's become a business. Uh, they can make as much as 30,000 pounds in a week, uh, which is probably as much as they make the whole year. So there's an incentive to go allow the hoaxing. Uh, and that is unacceptable by any length of the imagination. One thing you mentioned a, a few minutes back, um, I just want to retouch on this. That I don't know how much you could talk about this, about um, some of the healings that are taking place within 
believed in using subtle energies. I, I have spoken with Lucy Pringle, and I know she she wrote extensively about that in her book, um, that she's done some good work. And, and then you also mentioned something else, and then I'll let you go here. But you, you mentioned about how um, there hasn't been that much funding within it. Do you know of like private organizations that are that are working on this and are, have used this as kind of a, a jumping off point to try and unravel this? Because there are apparently there are some significant benefits to this subtle energy. Oh, there's huge benefits, and uh, there's thousands of case uh, histories to prove this. Uh, and I mean, I get feedback from thousands of people that uh, you know that they to, to plug this. Uh, to buy my crop circle cards, which again, I've, I've never advertised. It's pure word of mouth. I've never received, let's see, in uh, 25 years that I've been selling these things on my website, um, I've had one guy who wanted his money back because he thought they were tarot cards. Uh, that's incredible. And some of the, the stuff that I uh, hear back from people, uh, there's one person that uh, was healed of cancer in three days, bone cancer. This is impossible. This is why there's a big cover up going on because it's practically free energy and free uh, healing. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved because there's a huge benefit here to people. Uh, not that I want to use the word healing. It's actually the wrong term. There's a, there's a meeting of energy. Uh, the crop circle is an energy form. We see the shape, but behind it is the, what's really going on. And that's what's important. So you're taking this energy form, you trans, uh, you uh, transposing it onto a piece of cardboard with a system that I can't tell you about because it's to stop people creating fake cards, which don't do you any good. These aren't just symbols. There's something in the actual ink that's been put there. Uh, and I won't tell you what it is. I've sworn to secrecy. Um, and if you uh, assume that that is a living uh, organism, which is alive, and you bring the human being, which is another living being, it does an in interchange of energy. And there's a meeting of minds. There's an exchange of information. And that's how the energy and the frequency of the crop circles and the healing ability transfers to human beings and also to the land. I mean, they've used this in the Germany. There's an institute that was working with these in Germany uh, in the early days uh, where they would take the image of the crop circle. They would transfer the energy to a dying forest in the, in the Czech Republic. And within three years, the vitality of the forest is growing back. And they didn't do anything else. They were just sending the signal to the hard drive in the forest and it grew by itself. That is incredible. And it started off as a channel message back in 1985. So it's all the science fiction is now becoming science fact. Wow. Well, Freddie, we, we got just a few more minutes here. Um, uh, d d you, can you, can you hang out for another five minutes? I'd love to pull up just one more. Oh, I'm sure circle. I can. Drilling outside my house. They've been drilling, uh, taking out the entire road. This is a rare moment of quiet where you don't hear like an earthquake going out outside. So we'll milk it while we're here. Perfect. The stars are aligning for us. Um, this is one I think you have spoken on before. Let me know when you can see this one. Oh, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about this? And correct me if I'm wrong. Does this encode a couple different ways of calculating the speed of light? Three speeds of light. Uh, and it's, uh, okay. there's a couple of guys called David Percy and David Myers. Italian. Sorry, a lot of pollen around here. Um, they are scientists. Uh, they wrote a book called Two Thirds, A History of Our Galaxy, which I don't recommend lightly. It'll do your head unless you're into big numbers, but it's very useful. What's and, that book? Um, they were uh, basically uh, enamored by this design and they went around, they, dry, they drove from London, they measured every centimeter of this and they work out. Uh, and there was another identical design on the other side of the hill that appeared the same night. And they didn't know that at the time. And they measured that and they overlaid the two series of numbers. They found that there were three groups of discrepancies between the two. And one of them, uh, they said, wait a minute, those are the numerical values of the known speed of light. So, uh, show, can we extrapolate that the other two variations in the numbers would be the second and third speeds of light? They published it. They got laughed out of the room, of course. And five years later, uh, uh you know, uh, as you know, academics tend to do. It's like a little mafia that they have. One, one of their kinds, you know, that they, you know, one of their buddies agrees that this is correct, then they'll give themselves a pat on the back and they'll take credit for it. And they said, yeah, uh, we just discovered that there's a second speed of light in the universe. And now they're postulating that there may be a third speed of light. So these two guys, just by measuring uh, and putting a hypothesis, they were actually way ahead of the pack. And also the crop circle makers uh, were already way ahead of us as well. So, and, and like they said, 
we're giving you new information to get you used to there's a, you have to get out of the perception that you're in this limited environment called earth. There's something much more bigger going on in the universe. And you're literally heading like lemmings over a, a cliff. Uh, your civilization is on its knees. It's finished. And unless you wake up, uh, you're not going to survive and we're not going to help you. We're going to provide you with the information to get you to act on your own behalf. That's how it works. No one's going to save you. You have to save yourself. Uh, the Navajo said the same thing. You're the ones you've been waiting for. Or was it the Hopi? I think it was the Hopi. You're the ones you've been waiting for. We're going kind to of give you some clues and you're going to have to work on this. So slowly we're getting there. We're going to take it right up to the very edge, of course. <laughs> Fascinating. Freddie, this has been an absolutely awesome conversation. Um, I really respect you and your work. It's, it's well, thank you. always interesting to hear you speak. Can you tell people where they can find you, your websites, and what have you got coming, coming in the future? Oh, God, yeah. Please go to my website, invisibletemple.com. Yeah, there's nine books now. I have a new book called Portal coming out in about two weeks. And uh, it's, it's a bit unusual because I didn't want to write another book for a while. Uh, again, I'm not compelled to keep writing uh, like I'm on a, you know, uh, automatic pilot. And I just wanted to let things sit, learn something new. And uh, I was talked into this by a publisher. Uh, and um, I said, actually, I could probably write that in my sleep. Uh, and I did in a couple of weeks. And uh, it's going to be about how ancient places, how they work and what they do for you and to you. Uh, it's a very succinct book. Uh, it has a third section, which is the practical application of how to work with the, the portals on our planet, how to interact with them, and also a central section, which is uh, the stories of 12 people who've actually done this already and their personal stories. So a little different. Uh, it's more of a more personal because it talks about my personal experiences and I, I never talk about myself or rarely do. So you get to see a little bit more of me as the real me rather than the uh, writer me. Uh, and um, I've also come out with a three-part series on Egypt, a three-part yeah. documentary, which I'm pretty proud of actually. Uh, and I'd never, ever, I'm never happy with anything that I do. So this time I'm actually pretty happy with this. And it's taken years to put this together from an angle that no one's ever covered. And it follows the story that begins with the followers of Horus arriving in Egypt in, in uh, 10,500 BC and how the whole of Egypt can be seen from that perspective. So hopefully uh, you like that one too, because it took a while to put together. So it's, uh, it's going to be good. Wow. All right, Freddie. Yeah, there was one more question from a friend of mine, Candace. She, she wanted to know your thoughts on, on Shiprock. Is that in New Mexico? Four corners, uh, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. If I've got my geology right. Um, it's a very powerful portal. It was for the Anasazi. Uh, uh, it's a petrified angel. The story goes that this uh, silver bird comes from Venus, lets the people off in that spot, goes into the earth. Once the people are safe, comes back up as the eroded throat of this volcano. That's what it is. Uh, you shouldn't climb it. It's very dangerous. It's sacred to the Navajo now. And there's a, a cave up there where they do their out of body journey for three days and they come back risen from the dead figured that one out. That's thousands of years ago, that phrase. Uh, and it's a major portal, a uh, major magnetic hotspot, geomagnetic hotspot. And it's very humbling. Uh, I've seen grown men cry at the base of that, uh, that place. It will open you up like a can of sardines. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, all these places are the same, whether they are marked by a geological uh, hotspot or whether it's a standing stone or a temple, it's the same thing. The purpose is to wake you up to who you are as a soul and get you to connect with yourself so you can live your life here much more purposefully. Uh, ultimately, that's the purpose of every sacred site. So, uh, and I bring that up in the, the new book portal is all about that, uh, to get you to connect to these places that know where to go. And a lot of them are very, uh, they're not so obvious. They're in the middle of urban centers, like in Portland, Maine. I've had, one of them comes right through my living room. I mean, literally where I'm sitting, sitting right now is one of those energy lines comes right through me. It's the only place where I can get any work done in the whole building where I can have a computer connected. So not by accident that I'm feeding off the energy and it's feeding off me as well. It's a two-way system. So Shiprock is pretty much like that as well, but it's, um, it's raw. It's very raw power down there. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. She, she really wanted to know about that. Yeah. It's a very masculine energy. Not, it's not for everybody. Well, Freddie, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'd love, love to it. have you back on anytime. Um, I'll put links to all your stuff in the description below and, um, yeah. Have a, have a great day. I really appreciate everything. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for watching the show. I hope you guys are enjoying the content. 
If you're finding any value, please hit that subscribe button, that like button, and leave a comment. It doesn't cost you anything, and it really helps out the show.